All right, good morning, everybody. You can all hear me? Okay. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I do now as an engineer, and also how I came to be, become an engineer. What are the things I thought about when I was your age exactly? So um, I am an engineer now, and uh, I work for uh, Broadcom, and I'll start explaining some of those things. And a, a lot of the things you saw downstairs, those are the things I had when you're exactly your age. Okay, I am gonna ask a few questions. So uh, again, raise your hand, shout out some answers, right, as we ask them. So what do people use to connect to the internet? I heard a lot of people say Wi-Fi, good answer. David gave you that answer earlier. There are other technologies too, but I'm gonna talk about Wi-Fi as well, all right? This one's getting harder. How old is Wi-Fi? 18, how do you guys actually know 18 years? It is 18 years. Okay, so uh, obviously it started before you guys were born, right? And we've had a couple different generations of it and it's gotten faster and faster and we're still working on the next generations of Wi-Fi too. I was actually in Dallas this week to uh, work on the next generation of Wi-Fi called 802.11ax. Okay, where do you think Wi-Fi comes from? Over here. Uh, router, yes. Over here in the back. Speak up. Okay, over here. Uh, uh, yes, Comcast kind of, kind of comes from it. But I'm kind of thinking about what, what we're all in here, right? It comes from engineers, it comes from people. So somebody actually had to, to build it. Somebody had to have the ideas to make Wi-Fi. Somebody had to uh, make the ideas to test it and, des and design it. And so uh, I actually work in two of those groups, uh, Wi-Fi Alliance. There's actually a group called Wi-Fi Alliance that helps uh, test and certify Wi-Fi. And there's another group called uh, IEEE or the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. And basically it's a big group of engineers and we get together a couple times a year and we work on the next generation of Wi-Fi. So again, it started about 18 uh, years ago, okay? But Wi-Fi isn't the only technology uh, that you can use inside of your home. You may not know it, but you have some of these other technologies. So I talked about Wi-Fi. Now the thing about Wi-Fi is it doesn't use any wires, right? It just uses the air. But there are other technologies, like HomePlug, right? HomePlug uses the electrical sockets that you have inside your home to actually make a network. So a lot of uh, devices these days ha uh, use that as well. There's another technology called Mocha that uses the coaxial cable. Now, you may not notice this cable in your house, but if you've got a TV or a set-top box, or you, you know, you're watching a Comcast or something like that, you probably have this coaxial cable in your home and that also can be used as a network. And all these different types of networks are the areas I work in. So my specialty is communications, right? So I help design with a big team of people, as I was a lot of other engineers, to, to make these kinds of technologies and also uh, to test them. Okay, so I mentioned I work for Broadcom, and you've heard Broadcom mentioned a couple different times, right? But what does Broadcom actually do? So I think the easiest way to say is we make the brains or we call them the chips. So you've already uh, seen uh, some of them, uh, uh, some of them like that. If you have ever seen a smartphone, has anybody ever actually taken apart a smartphone? Seen inside? Okay, a fair number of you, excellent, right? So uh, there's usually these kinds of circuits right inside, in, inside the smartphone, and that's what makes the smartphone smart, right? So that's, that's kind of the brains. Now, of course, today uh, you're using Raspberry Pis, as it turns out, Broadcom actually makes that chip, that brains, that, that one right in the middle, that is the brains uh, of the Raspberry Pi. So that's what my company does. We make those chips, and I help design some of the communication, like the Wi-Fi, that uh, works on those kinds of chips and some other chips that we make. Okay, but besides just making the technology, one of the really exciting things I get to do is actually talk about the technology like I'm talking about with you today. I actually go as part of my job, and I travel actually all over the world, and I go talk to customers and try to get them excited about these kinds of chips and all the great uh, features that they can do with it. And one of the ways we get people excited is by doing demonstrations. If we just talk, it's not that exciting, but people like to see and uh, like to be able to try 
and play around with some of these really cool things that we can do. And so we actually build uh, a couple of uh, different things. We have this uh, big show we go to. We actually built a house inside of this room so we could show all the features of some of the things we do. And then I made a little smaller version as well, too, so that we can just take that around the Oop, do we? Yeah. So basically, uh, you also see some software. So just like you guys have a monitor on the table so you can see what's going on inside that Raspberry Pi, we do the exact same thing when we're demonstrating it. So, oop, got too excited there. Uh, we have these monitors on the side where we actually explain and, and show the software running. So you have some simple software right now, but we spent a lot of time with a lot of other software engineers uh, to make that exciting. So I get to take that around. Now, I want you to see, it's kind of hard to see, but this is like a, a front door of the house. And on this front door, we've got a doorbell and we've got a camera. So remember, we're going to have that because I'm going to show you what we're going to do with that. So um, inside this house, this is kind of like a smart house. So remember, we talked about smartphones uh, a while before, right? So now we're trying to make houses smart. So you can come home and your house maybe knows what you want or makes your life more easy uh, or just gives you some interesting information that you didn't know about. And uh, all of these here are, again, TV screens, or like the monitors you have. And normally, this TV screen is where you would be watching TV, maybe a movie or something like that. But as your house is starting to become smart, we're going to use that screen also for the house to communicate, for the house to talk to us. So I have a couple different things going on. So uh, on this one, I have a couple of cameras in this house. And so I'm actually able to see uh, what's going on inside the house. Over here, when I'm watching TV, I don't know if you can see, I have locked. So that's, that's the status of the front door. It's telling me that the front door of my house is locked, because sometimes I forget. I actually forget uh, on that. And so when I'm watching TV, I can have a little notification right inside letting me know if I did it. Or the temperature of the house, if it's getting uh, cold, need to turn on the heater, um, or if other parts of the house are ready. I can also control the house. Right? So I can do those, uh, just, uh, turn on the lights, uh, turn on the heater, and all those uh, kinds of things. And actually, these are kind of the things I was thinking about uh, when I was about your age. And I actually uh, put in some stuff in my own room to, to turn that on. Now, I mentioned that doorbell before. And if you can see, right on the TV is a sign that says, the doorbell's been pressed. So if someone comes, right, and I'm watching TV, I don't actually have to get up uh, to go see if someone's at the door. Right? Because there's a, there's a camera at the front door. It's displaying right on my TV that, uh, their face. And so I can see who's at the front door. So you're going to see a little bit later, I have an interest in doorbells. I have an interest in, ma in making the homes uh, uh, smart. And so again, this is the kind of work I do now, besides helping design those protocols, I get to talk about it. And that's a lot of fun, because it's a lot of fun to show all these kinds of demos. All right. So that's what I do now. But of course, I wasn't always an engineer. And so I want to talk a little bit about what are the things that I thought about, what are the things I did that kind of made me interested, actually, to go to school and become an engineer. And uh, I'm going to show some pictures. I, it's fine to laugh. I, you know, uh, Some of them are going to be kind of funny. But this is actually what, what I was doing when I was a kid. OK. So my first job, right, before, before I went to school um, you know, for college or anything like that, uh, well, this actually wasn't my first job, but I think my grandfather got his idea from this. This is me picking oranges at, at my grandfather's place. When I was your age, right, my grandfather invited me down to his farm. In his farm, he had avocados. So he had these avocados, and I'm like, oh, this is great. I'm going to have fun, and I'm going to drive the tractor around. And he said, no, 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 no. This is going to be a job. Your job is going to be pick, picking avocados and selling avocados. And how do you pick avocados? I don't know if you can see, but these trees are tall. They're 10, 15, 20 feet tall. So in order to pick those avocados, I've got to get this very long pole. You can see it's like 10 or 15 feet long, and try and snip off those avocados and pick them up. Okay? I learned about science and physics in doing this. I thought I was just going to be picking avocados, but this I learned. So I don't know if you've ever seen this, but there's a trade-off with if you have a heavy weight and you have a long lever, Right? You can use that long lever to lift that heavy weight. And there's a balance of that. So if you have some, 
something uh, heavy uh, on one end, then you can actually uh, pick it up with actually just using a little bit of force. Well, the opposite is also true. If I've got a couple of pounds of uh, avocados in there, and I have this really long pole, this 10 or 15 foot pole, any ideas what's gonna happen? Right there. They, they can drop out? Yeah, well they will drop out, but right over there. Depending on how heavy it is, it could lift me. That's very close to what it is. So I actually, as that five pounds is kind of on that long pole, kind of the opposite, it's like 50 pounds. So I'm a little kid and I'm trying to hold 50 pounds, what it feels like 50 pounds because it was, it was just uh, five pounds on that. So I got to learn a little bit about science before I thought I was gonna learn about that. And uh, so uh, this was actually a lot of hard work. The other thing I got to learn was uh, with avocados, you gotta sell them quickly. If you don't sell them quickly, they go, they go bad, right? So there was a time value to selling, selling those avocados. So why I, what I kind of learned was, while this was a good work, this was not the kind of work I wanted to do, okay? So what did I like to do? Does anybody recognize what these are up here? Legos, yes, yes, yes. So when I was your age, there was a new amusement park that opened up, so you guys got Great America up here. I have a Knott's Berry Farm down there. And they had one of the first looping roller coasters. Now you see looping roller coasters all, all around, right? But that was actually one of the first ones. Now I was excited. How do you actually you know, get, uh, get the loop to go around? And so uh, I decided, hey, I'm gonna try and see if I could build one of these with Legos, right? So it's got the, you know, the tall ramp where you go up, go across, around. And it's, I know it's hard to see, but that was actually the, the upside down loop part. So I was actually trying to, to see if I could make that same loop, uh, loop with the tools I had there. Now, I also had to do a science project at the same age, right? Again, you can start to see the, the funny pictures of me. So the way I found my science project was, I was reading the newspaper, and the guy at the local Taco Bell, the manager, had put in solar eating in his uh, Taco Bell. He was trying to save energy by using the sun to heat the hot water for the restaurant. And I said, hey, that sounds kind of interesting. I wonder how he does that. I wonder how solar heating works. So I actually went, went down to the Taco Bell, talked to the manager, and he explained a little bit how, how solar heating worked. And, uh, and, and the basic part is, you know, I have something black, something that absorbs the heat, right? And then I had kind of a tank up here to, to hold that. And I didn't even need a a, uh, a pump or anything, because just the water being hot, of course, uh, hot air, hot water hot rises, and so that would actually automatically kind of be a, a tank, um, a pump for, for the unit. So, um, and of course, uh, you know, I had to do my uh, report on, on this, and, uh, you know, they said, hey, you know, good job and everything, but you could improve on your punctuation and spelling, right? So make sure you always get the details uh, you can see I had a lot of spelling mistakes, and if you get emails from me, you still see I have spelling mistakes, so sorry about that. Okay, so, so I'm doing these kinds of things, and I'm not really thinking, these are engineering things, I'm just having fun. These are the kinds of things that we do, you know, at your age, right? So, um, who knows what you call the person who drives a train? Right there. Conductor? Conductor? Yeah, they, they, they're part of it. There's another name for who actually drives it. Engineer, exactly. So that's one definition of engineer. And do you know why they call the train, uh, the train drivers engineers? Because they run the engine and keep it going. Yes, they did break. So between the two, that's what, it, that's what the original definition of engineers was. You're running the e engine, you're keeping it working, and, you're, and if it breaks, right? So uh, again, that wasn't exactly it. So for Halloween, you know, we just had Halloween. Uh, I thought maybe it'd be in a computer, but again, not, not thinking about that. But uh, here you can see um, I've got my research lab for my birthday present, my science kit, my telegraph kit. Telegraphs is way before telephones, right? So I actually, I was just kind of playing. These were the toys uh, that, uh, that I had to, to do this. This was my dad's lab. He actually had a lab in the garage and you can see one of the uh, early PCs in there, uh, some uh, oscilloscopes, some other kind of electrical stuff. 
this is where I got to hang out and watch my dad be an engineer as well, too. And I was able to see that it's really fun to be an engineer because uh, in some of the stuff he did. You guys have exactly that same opportunity, right? So this was a little rare when I was a kid, but you are here today, you guys are in an awesome lab, you're playing with the same kinds of tools, right? You have a computer, you have the screens, you have the resistors, you have the LEDs. These are all the kinds of things that, that, that uh, we used to play around with in the lab. And uh, I have to show uh, my, my mom and my dad and my sister, because again, my dad and my parents were, were great inspirations in, in kind of showing uh, what it's like to be an engineer and to think about things and uh, uh, just to be creative on that. Okay, so besides thinking about engineering, I also had a dream. And I think you heard people mention dreams and challenges earlier today, and um, my dream always was flying. I don't know why I like flying. Well, maybe I do. Uh, this is my grandfather's plane. He liked to fly. That's what he did for, for a while. Um, of course, I liked to go flying, too, when I, I was a kid. So when I was, uh, I think, 11, maybe 10, um, actually, a friend of my parents uh, took me up in an airplane. And I actually got to fly over uh, Southern California. And it's a little hard to see, but this is actually the control, control panel of an airplane. And uh, I got so excited about this, and it seemed uh, so hard to do, that in high school, I actually learned to fly an airplane. And it was one of those things, it's clearly a dream, but I actually kind of put the practice in. You had, you know, just like getting a driver's license, which you'll all be starting to think about in a couple of years. Same kind of thing for getting a plane license. And so, um, it, again, that was my dream to go do that. And I actually took up my uh, two sisters in the little airplane. It wasn't one of these little tiny ones, not, not the big ones. And uh, this is kind of the other part I want to say that you'll never know when you'll inspire someone, right? You guys, just by being here, you're showing leadership, you're showing, uh, you're gonna be talking, you're gonna be inspiring your teammates. You, uh, uh, as you get older, you'll be inspiring, you know, maybe your younger brothers and sisters or other kids at school. Be excited about inspiring folks. And so um, I actually, and I didn't realize it then, I inspired my, my little sister, sister Corrine. So, she also trained to be an engineer. She was a civil engineer. I'm an electrical engineer, she's a civil engineer. Civil engineers build big things. But she kind of had that same dream with, with flying as well too. So uh, besides being a civil engineer, after she went to school, she also wanted to learn to fly. And she really took it really far. So this is a, a, a big uh, um, uh, jet aircraft, right? And so that's actually her flying that, that jet aircraft. So she actually took her dream to very far. Those aircrafts are called uh, F-18s, and she's actually on the cover of a magazine flying, flying that, air, that airplane. So, uh, and now she flies for Delta. So a, again, she did engineering, but she also mixed in what, what her dream was of uh, uh, flying as well, too. Okay, you hear a lot about flying. I like flying. Uh, of course, engineer, uh, flying takes a lot of engineering, right? Engineers built the airplanes, right? So. I like air, uh, flying so much that you probably can't see it, but I've flown and collected over 9.5 million miles. 9.5 million miles. Any idea how many times around the Earth 9.5 million uh, miles are? Okay? A lot, all right. So, to answer that question, well, how far around the Earth is it? Anybody know how far the circumference is? 24,000 miles, all right? So I'm gonna approximate a little bit and, and call that 25,000 miles, right? So if we do the quick math on that, who's got a quick answer or approximation? A little more, a little more. 400 would have been a good estimate, right? 10 million by 25,000 is about 400 miles. So that's about 380, 380 times around the Earth. So I have flown around the Earth a lot of times. I love flying, and that's part of, part of the dream. And I actually mix my dream of my job uh, with my job uh, today. Okay, because I love traveling, so when I, went, I thought about going to college, and I, I know all you guys are thinking about going to college, right? Part of, part of becoming an engineer, you do have to spend some time in college, right? 
is I thought, well, maybe, because um, I live down here in Southern California, maybe I'll come up here. And I actually thought about going to a famous university here, right? I thought that was the place I should go, right? That was, that was one of the dreams I had. And they said no. They said no. And what did I do? Just say, okay, well, I, I'm not, I'm not going to go to college. No. I actually found another college, right? I, I actually uh, didn't travel quite as far. I only had to go 20 miles from uh, living in the northern part of Orange County going down to UC Irvine. Anybody have Id any idea what this is? I heard an ad bark, but it is an anteater. So uh, kind of a strange mascot. Eats ants, right? But, uh, you know, and we have the, uh, we have the swing, uh, zot zot, right? Uh, but University of California, Irvine is where I got my first engineering degree. Uh, it's called a Bachelor's of Science. And I uh, spent uh, four, four years there. And I uh, really started learning some of the, 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 uh, the, the basics of engineering. Now, not all the things uh, at, at there did I like, right? There was a lot of physics classes and things like that. So don't worry. You don't have to love math in order to be an engineer. I'm one of those people. I didn't like math as much, but I did, did need to learn it, right? And so that kind of goes back to why do we go to school? To learn, kind of, yes. Have fun, absolutely, did some of that. Any other ideas? Yeah, good, right there. That's right, to get knowledge, to get prepared. Go ahead. Prepare for the future, exactly, right? And so I know some of you said learning, and that of course is what you do, but we're not just there to learn for learning. We're actually learning so we actually can design. We're gonna come up with new problems, and there's gonna be new problems to solve, and having techniques and how to solve them. So uh, learning just for the sake of learning is, is fine, but especially for engineers, engineers build things. Maybe it's build software, maybe it's build devices, whatever. So we're learning the tools uh, to build things. And I don't know if some of you saw in the second half, right? We had, a, we had a small problem there. One of the tables was broken, right? Again, going in there and solving the problems, right? The other part of, of um, learning as well, too, is the... Uh, testability, right? Because as you see, some of the things that we're doing here, it's not always going to work the first time. And if you've, uh, and if you've done it, um, you also need to make sure that it works. And so, again, a lot of the work when we talk about design, i.e. the design code build, is not just to get it to work the first time, to make sure it keeps working. And actually, that was uh, uh, one of the first things I did. Okay. So... I love school so much that I decided to go get another engineering degree. And this time, again, because I like to travel, I went across the country 2,000 miles to Pittsburgh. And the name of the school is, is, is Carnegie Mellon. And, uh, and then in that second degree I got is called a master's, Master of Science in Electrical and Computer Engineering. So there, I mix both the hardware, for example, like the Raspberry Pi, right? with the software, the software you're typing in into the screen, so uh, it does both. Uh, I also want to point out, I had an advisor there. There was actually one teacher who I spent a lot of time with who explained uh, a lot about engineering, a lot about designing, a lot about doing research. And again, seek out someone that you can talk to and can, can explain about it. Because some of the times when I was doing these really hard classes or these really hard math problems, right, it was great to go talk to them about some of the, some of the things that we could uh, help me understand. And because I'd already been playing around with some of the engineering things, I knew that the final goal uh, of being an engineer was gonna be fun, even though learning some of the tools was a lot of hard work. But I wasn't done. So later, I decided, all right, I'll go for one more degree. So it's called a uh, PhD, or a Doctor of Philosophy. They don't call it engineering, because you're supposed to be just a little bit more, uh, more general. Uh, to go there, I went 5,000 miles to Japan, a very long way, and uh, to, to learn. So that's actually my uh, professor, uh, Dr. Sato, and when he was uh, retiring recently. And again, same kind of thing. 
we would kind of meet on a weekly basis to kind of talk and figure out, hey, what are these kinds of things, that we need, problems we need to solve, and how do we actually go do that? And uh, so while I was there, as part of the PhD, you actually have to do uh, some research work and show that you can work by yourself, right? So today, right, we have some, uh, 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 some of the people helping, the pie makers, right? And uh, so, we're, so we're in the learning phase, but at a certain point, part of it is you should be able to not only solve the problems, but help figure out what the problems are in, in the first place, right? And part of that is I, I usually, with a PhD, you get to write a dissertation. And so that's where I got to actually write my first book. So, you know, the textbooks that you have, right? Somebody had to write them, right? And so uh, a part of the work of uh, some of the PhDs is actually being able to start writing your own, own material so you can also help teach people. Remember how I said you never know when you'll inspire someone? Part of that is being able to write it down or talk and explain uh, some of your ideas. Okay, why did I go to Japan? Well, I set some goals, right? One of the things you have to do, part of designing and planning, is set some goals. You have some things that you want to do, right? So literally, and it's surprising how much they mesh with some of the goals we're talking about today, right? But these were the, were the five reasons why I went to, went to Japan. Number one is I wanted adventure and travel. Well, you know I like traveling, you know I like flying, so that's why I went there. Another uh, uh, goal that I wanted to do, I wanted to learn a new language, right? I grew up in California, I just knew English. I wanted to learn a new language. So I actually learned Japanese. So, minasan, ohayo gozaimasu, is good morning, everybody, right? So, while I was there, I actually learned another language, Japanese. Yes, I can speak Japanese. So, uh, we can practice afterwards, but the, the minasan, ohayo gozaimasu was, was actually Japanese. Uh, I wanted to learn about high technology. Again, we're in the Computer History Museum, tons of high technology, and high technology changes very, very rapidly. So, and you're working on high technology here today, and you'll continue to be working on high technology, right? So, I wanted to learn more about it. And, and when I went to Japan in, in uh, the end of the 80s, right, that's what hotbed or robotics and all kinds of really exciting technology was going on. I wanted to learn about working in a group, working in a team, right? In America, kind of there's this, uh, you know, rough and tough, and I'm, a, I'm my own guy, and I can, I can do everything. A lot of individual uh, thinking in, in America, which is very good and necessary. But I also kind of wanted to learn about working in a group and working in a team, and Japan is very famous for that. And so when I, I went in, and I, um, as part of his learning to uh, work as a group. Now this last one, this may or may not interest you now, I wanted to marry a Japanese woman. I had met some when I was in college, and I decided that's, that's what I wanted to do. This is, that's what I actually did. That's me, sorry for the strange hair there, but I actually met this beautiful woman, her name's Eiko, and, and we got married. And we had uh, three kids. I have twin boys, uh, uh, Andy and Ronnie, and then my daughter, Amy, uh, uh, is in sixth grade as well. So uh, we all like uh, technology and designing things in our family uh, as well. Andy, I graduated in computer science. He's a software engineer now. He's working for a startup. Uh, Ronnie, uh, also uh, interested in urban planning. So he helps plan cities and roads and things that go in there. And uh, he's also right now uh, um, going to work on his master's, his second degree. And he's also working for Caltrans, right? You see the, guy, the Caltrans guys on the freeways helping design our roads, right? And uh, my daughter, Amy, uh, Sure enough, uh, I got my old Lego set out, and so she's starting to build uh, Legos and design things as well. So it, it really starts at, kind of at any age where you can get excited about these kind of design things. Okay, so my first product that I actually built as an engineer, right, after getting out of school, uh, had a problem to solve. And remember I was talking about earlier when I was doing the demonstration, that uh, how do I know who's at my, my front door, right? And uh, so we put a, uh, a camera there and we, we put a doorbell button, okay? So when the doorbell rings, how do I know? So I wanted to work on a product that actually helped me to do that. So I had a second problem when we started on that, on that project, and this, this is a team project as well, is to make it cost-effective, 
i.e. so people could, could, could actually buy it so it wasn't too expensive, we needed to use a very cheap lens. And that cheap lens uh, had a, an effect called fisheye. Has anybody heard of fisheye? Right? Oh, great, a lot of you. So as you can kind of see, this nice square or rectangular building, right, it's all curved and looks, uh, looks kind of bent and things like that. It, it, it's, it happens from some of these cheap lenses uh, to give that effect. And it doesn't look that good. So this is actually one of, the, uh, uh, one of my lab colleagues, right? And so the same kind of thing where you see the, the things are bent, you can see his head's kind of bent. That's kind of the bent view. So if I'm looking at that picture, man, it doesn't look that good, right? His, his head's kind of bent. So we tried to design an algorithm that would straighten out his bent head so that even though the camera took this, uh, this uh, fisheye picture, and, and the camera, uh, and the picture normally would have looked like that way, we wanted to fix it so it looked better, so you looked more like a human. Well, the first time we tried uh, doing that, uh, we would stretch both the sideways and the up and down, and we got what I call pointy head, right? It just didn't look right. Mathematically, it was right. We'd moved the things, moved uh, the pixels to the side, and we moved them up, but it kind of made his head a little bit pointy on that side. So again, our first try wasn't good enough, right? We needed to, to find a better algorithm. So in the end, we actually made another algorithm that uh, just moved some of the parts of the picture to the side. We didn't move it up. It was actually easier and cheaper to build, and it actually looks better. Yeah, it's a little tilted, but it's, it's better than the, um, the bent head or the pointy head uh, that we had. So, um, so we had some ideas when we were building that product, right? One of them was fixing the, fixing the way the head looked, right? Some, some other kinds of things. And one of the things we did was file for a patent. Anybody knows what a patent is? Great, right there, yep, shout it out. Go ahead. Right, go ahead. Right, it states you own this idea. They can't copy it for a period of 17 years. Yes, next to you. Yep, it's a, it's a legal protection for your idea, right? Because if you go to the effort of thinking of something, right, the United States government, it says, hey, we will give you a patent uh, to protect it. Now, of course, you have to describe your idea. So you have to write some text, explain it. You have to explain your idea. Of course, you have to draw uh, some pictures of how it, remember I said we were moving some of those pixels around, and uh, draw some diagrams of, 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 how, of how it actually works, right? And so that's what the patents are. And at the end, after you wait a couple years, you can actually get one of these. So I have a bunch of these hanging up on the, on the wall. And so, all right, thank you. But uh, we take those ideas, right? You write them down, and then uh, so you can use them, and you can license them to other people as well, too. Okay, so we took, the, we took the, the problem we wanted to solve, we took some ideas, we wrote them down in a patent, right? And then we actually made a product. So remember I was talking about the chips before? It's an old photo, but there's a chip inside of there. And then you can actually see here, I have a TV. This is an old TV, it's not even LCD or LED like these nice ones you have now. It's like an old tube TV. And then this, this is actually the camera. And uh, this is actually the, the advertising brochure that we made it, for it. But I actually brought it today. I hadn't gotten it out in a long time, but you can see that same camera. And then as uh, someone comes to the door, they press the doorbell. Let's see if I can, uh, so if I'm gonna turn around here, and actually you can see it on there. And then uh, you can uh, zoom around and do some other fun things. And actually that is actually with that, with that cheap lens, we're actually in real time, and this is back before uh, signal processing, it was easy. We're actually doing that un unbending of the uh, of the uh, of the picture. Okay. So, yes. Question. This particular model is not. So this is actually I did this about 20 years ago. But there are a lot of similar products now, and some of them, instead of using a TV screen, right? Remember we saw some that were showed on the TV, and also some on uh, you know maybe your smartphone. Okay, so I have a little bit of closing advice. Balance, if I had to say it in just one word, balance, 
That's one of the good engineering, you know, make sure it, it's, it's good enough, right? But if I explain that a little bit more is balance the must-dos with your dreams, right? So we're all gonna have to have jobs, right? Let's, let's do something fun, but kind of mix that with, with some of your dreams. And as you heard, one of my dreams was flying and traveling. And now with my job, even though I do, I'm designing products and explaining products, I get to travel around and, and uh, around the world. So I wanna thank you. Uh, you've all been great uh, pre audience, ask great questions. And I think we'll probably do a few questions and answers. Wonderful, thank you very much. Big round of applause for Steve, thank you. Thank you. Excellent. And so now we have time, now we have time for just a few questions. And so does anyone have any questions for him? Anything about the work he's done, the really cool phone he created or anything else? Okay, yeah? right up here. Yes, go ahead. Um, I remember that you said you worked with um, lots of engineers. Yes. Um, how, how much, how many, what's the most you've worked with? How many people? The most number of engineers? Okay. So when we made that TV door phone, right? It was a group of uh, five or six engineers in my team. For Wi-Fi, it's hundreds of engineers when we're working together. And uh, actually the company I work for at Broadcom, we have about 8,000 engineers in our company. So most times you, you'll start with small groups, but uh, it can be a very large team to make some of these projects, these very complicated projects. Okay, over. Wait, we got another question here in front. Great. Um, my question is, what's, what's the largest problem you've ever had to overcome? And I don't mean like the largest problem while you're designing your products, like you know, in your life, what's the largest problem, the largest challenge that you've had to overcome? Awesome question. And you're not gonna believe this problem. I'm actually very shy. I don't like to talk in front of people. Now, it doesn't seem that way, but in high school, I was very shy, I was a very shy kid, and I finally had to decide I have got to overcome this. I have got to be able to talk with people because you can have a great idea, but if you can't explain it to people, maybe it's, it's, it's not as good of an idea that way. So I had to learn, I had to force myself to not be shy, to speak up and, and talk to people. That, that was my greatest challenge, to, to overcome my shyness. Good question. Great, we've got another question here in front. Next. Okay, go ahead. Uh, how long did it take to uh, make that doorbell camera? How long did it take to make the door phone? So it took about two and a half years. So part of the time we did some research on how to bend the uh, pictures to make it look well. And then part of the time to make that chip, we had to uh, work with uh, another team to bake that chip. So uh, it actually it was, took about two and a half, three years from the time we started thinking about it until it was actually a product that you could go buy in the store. Right here. Um, since it takes like a lot of time to just make one of them and lots of, and like five or six people to just make one of them, is there an easier way that you can make more of them in like a faster time? A another great question. How can we do things faster? So one of the things engineers do is build tools to make the job easier for other engineers. So uh, there's a lot more software programs, et cetera. So many of the things that we had to do by hand in those days, now there's a computer application that helps us. So uh, one of the great things about technology is engineers help to invent the technology that helps invent the technology. And so uh, uh, those are some of the tools that we can use on that. And that kind of reminds me, you know, you saw some of the, the, all the computers, right, down there. Those are the kind of computers I had as my age. You got new computers now, because other engineers made new computers, you guys will also be helping to make the next generation to make it even easier to make and faster to make products. Great, thank you. We have another question. So the door phone was in the 80s. What are you doing today? <laughs> that was in the 80s. Well, as you saw, I was actually this year still working on door phones, right? So we've had it, instead of having a, a separate uh, phone, I actually had it on the TV. But that was part of a smart home. And the smart home is, is having all the lights and devices and windows and things hooked up to your home and it communicating to you. That's one thing. The other thing I'm working on now that I hinted at is uh, energy. Saving energy with all these products, they take a lot of electricity. So I am doing a lot of work in, in saving power now too on these connected homes. Okay, another question over here. 
Okay. Did you know the smallest jet is 12 feet? The smallest jet is 12 feet. I did not know that, but you're proving something. We should learn something every day. I've learned something. Great. Thank you. Okay. And one more. Um, this isn't about engineering, uh, okay. but how many countries have you been to? Because you said you travel a lot. How many countries have I been to? I think it's about 45. There's 192 countries on the, on the globe, so I've still got a long way to go. About 45 countries. Uh, South America, Asia, Australia, um, and Europe. Ah, yes, I have been to South Africa as well, too. That was about three years ago. Yeah, I have not been to Antarctica, so I, that's one place I need to go. Okay. Oops, oh, right here. Um, where did you get the materials to build the products in the beginning? Like, you know, the hardware, you know, to build your chips and all that? You said you worked with the team? Yes. So, uh, so for some of those earlier projects, you know, my dad had some of this stuff. Or, and there was actually, a, it's called Ford Electronics is where I bought a lot of that. The, st the material to make chips, any ideas what the material is that is inside the chip? Silicone. silicone. What's the common name for silicone? Sand. It's just sand. So we melt down the sand and, and put in the circuits with coppers and things like that. So it's actually really basic ingredients for, uh, for making the chip. Sand and, and copper, the same thing you have in the, in the pennies. In the back there. How did you overcome your shyness? How did I overcome shyness? Practice. Practice, right? I put myself in positions where I had to talk, right? You'd have to do a speech in front of class or things like that. You practice at home, practice in front of my, my sisters, right? To do something you want to do, practice. That's, that's the simple thing. It's hard. I didn't feel good when I was doing it at first. I was nervous, but I just kept practicing. Even now, I'm still a little nervous, but I do it. Right here. Um, since computers and chips are always trying to become smaller and more yes. portable, and you design a lot of things like the door phone. What's kind of the hardest thing that you face when trying to make a device more portable and smaller? The hardest thing when you're making a device uh, smaller and portable is power. And, and there's two real problems with power, right? Uh, it, it takes a, a big battery uh, to do that. And when you're doing all those calculations, it gets hot. You'll actually feel those boards, those Raspberry Pis, it gets warm, the monitors get warm. Things get too hot, uh, it, they actually melt and, and break. So when you're mi miniaturizing them, heat and power are the two big problems for solving that. And anybody who can solve those problems, you got a job for life. Right here, yes. When I was in fourth grade, I did a presentation to the t school district. Okay. And I assume maybe you were a little nervous too? But, but as part of practice. I practiced a lot. There you go. I'm not lying. You gotta, all you got to do is practice. Great. OK, another question over here. Right here. Uh, who inspired you to become an engineer? Was it your dad or like who? So definitely my dad. My dad was also an engineer. But at the end, he never said, you have to be an engineer, right? And it was uh, uh, working you know, and, and actually trying and doing it myself. So, uh, you know, when I, again, about your age, too, I started programming a little bit, starting building circuits. I built a little uh, organ out of popsicle sticks and things like that. So, you know, having some of the materials, having some of these labs is a great place. And like I said, my family and then uh, a lot of my teachers, I, I, I put some of them on there um, from, from the school I went to. But it could be anybody who inspires you. Yeah. Right. We have One last question here for you. Okay. What kind of programming did you do in the 80s? In those days, uh, and it was actually the 70s, I'm actually that old, uh, my first language was basic. So uh, it, you had to write line numbers and, and things like that. So I actually programmed in basic. And then uh, Fortran, which you never will see again. Uh, and then C. I, I, I started le learning C in college, and, and C is very, very common today. So in that sense, things haven't changed. Was there an extra last question? An extra last question. All right. And then that's really the last question. 
it's kind of a build off of his question. What language do you think, um, what modern programming language do you think is the best today? It's a controversial topic. Ah, uh, yes, that is a very controversial topic, and I will defer on that topic. So uh, I actually like Perl. It's my favorite language to program. So I know it's not as common. There's a lot more cool Ruby on Rails, all that kind of good stuff, but I personally like to code in Perl. Okay. Again, one last, last question, and then okay. and, yeah. My mom's friend is the spouse of the guy who created Pearl. Well, there we go. We should meet. <laughs> that must be Larry Wall's wife. Larry Wall. All right, there you go. Cool. Which reminds me, some of those faces out there, it's really fun when you get to meet them. So it is a small world in engineering and communications. Absolutely. All right. So All right. I, well, I have one much. last question then. Uh oh. Because I, I keep saying that, but it's really last okay. question. So as we wrap up here, and you've shared some really great information and stories, what would be your parting advice for the students today um, as they move forward in their studies and careers and all the adventures and challenges that they'll face um, and hopefully all the fun they'll face? What would you recommend? Right. What would you suggest? So what I do recommend is remember how fun today was. Remember all the projects and stuff. Because there will be some days in school when you're going, this is crazy, this is hard. But remember, when you're actually doing engineering, it's a lot of fun. Remember this day. That's how I got through school and some of these things, by remembering all the, the fun times I had in the lab. Great. Thank you so Alrighty. much. Big round of applause for our rock star, Steve. Thank you.